Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Hashtag Ask the Assembly Weekly Monday Mailbag Video, where I answer your questions from Facebook and Twitter right here in this video forum. Here today for June 9th, 2014, another set of great questions. And uh, let's get right down to them. I believe the first one comes from Jared J. from Facebook. His question was, do you think comedic gimmicks like Tyler Breeze and Adam Rose have any shot of being WWE champion? Very good question. Um, It depends. The gimmicks, no. But the wrestlers, yes. I can't see Tyler Breeze in his current gimmick as WWE champion. But if you were to pull a Triple H, you say like the Hunter Hearst Helmsley gimmick that Triple H first had when he came into the WWE. That had no chance of being WWE champion. That was a mid-card gimmick at best. Same thing with Damian Sandow. I, I couldn't have seen his gimmick at the time being WWE champion material. However, as you evolve over time and you evolve your gimmick and you become more serious or whatever, then they become WWE champion. Hunter Hustomley went on to become Triple H, 13-time world champion in WWE, and one of the greatest of all time. So I could see, I'm not saying Tyler Breeze is an ex-Triple H, but if he were to change his gimmick up a little bit, I could probably, I, I'm not going to say I could see him as WWE champion, but I'm saying there's a chance. If someone like a Daniel Bryan in 2014 can hold the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, I don't see someone, I, I can't see why not someone like a Tyler Breeze can hold the World Championship in WWE. Not anytime soon, but if he were to evolve his gimmick, become more serious like he has been in recent weeks on NXT, go back and watch his match with Sami Zayn from NXT TakeOver if you don't believe me. This guy is a great in-ring asset. He's got a very entertaining character. It's entertaining, but it's mid-card at best. So he's just got to evolve over time, and I'm sure he will, into, I don't know if he'll change his name like Hunter Hearst Helmley to Triple H, but I could probably see him as a top star in WWE if he were to change his gimmick. Adam Rose is a different story. Adam Rose, not at all. Adam Rose, like Fandango, like the Funkasaurus, Brodus Clay, it has limited potential in, that, in terms of how far it can go. It's over here and there, and this is coming from a huge Adam Rose fan. Please keep that in mind. But it just that is not WWE champion material. Adam Rose is not champion material, championship material. Uh, maybe even mid card title material. Who knows? I I can't see him with a mid card championship. That being said, though, him as Leo Kruger was also very good. Who was better, Leo Kruger or Adam Rose? Is kind of up for debate. Kind of differs between everyone. Um, some people say they love Adam Rose more. Some people say they like Leo Kruger more. It all kind of depends on the person. Um, I personally like Adam Rose more. Leo Kruger was as methodical as he was. He can be seen as slow and boring and whatever. But um, even as Leo Kruger, I can't see Leo Kruger slash Adam Rose as WWE champion. Um, he could probably be up higher on the card as Leo Kruger. I just can't even see Leo Kruger as WWE champion. Leo Tyler Breeze is a different story because he's so great in the ring. He can put on great matches. Leo Kruger, he had good matches. He had some very good matches down in NXT against Cesaro, against Sami Zayn, against Adrian Neville, a bunch uh, against a number of uh, superstars down in NXT. But he never had any great matches. He never had any standout matches that made me think, wow, this guy's the next breakout star. You know what I mean? So um, it's really not so the gimmicks, but the superstars that themselves – that can go on to become world champion. So very good question there. Ross S. his question was, from the matches so far this year, what would be your nominees for match of the year? Um, so I put down five matches so far. Um, I think maybe one from every pay-per-view, or I, actually six, I forgot to write down one, but Cena Cesaro from Monday Night Raw, that was the only television match that comes to mind that really stood out as a match of the year candidate. I'm sure there's more, but that's the only one that really came to mind. The Shield versus the Wyatt Family, easy. I'd go with their Elimination Chamber matchup, but you can easily put on that list their Raw match, main event, their Raw rematch. Any of those matches between the Shield and Wyatt Family were fantastic. Um, the Shield and Evolution, I would personally go with their Extreme Rules match as opposed to their Payback match, but either one is great. Triple H versus Daniel Bryan, I think two months later that match is a little underrated. People were raving about it at the time, but... I really haven't heard people made any, make any comparisons to it in the last two months. So Triple H versus Daniel Bryan was a great opening match for WrestleMania 30. I would put that on the list. Cena versus Bray Wyatt, not their Mania match, not their Extreme Rules match. I, I wasn't a fan of either of those bouts. But I did love their last man standing match from Payback. So that was a great match. I'd put that on the list. And I forgot to put this on there. But Bray, Bray Wyatt versus Daniel Bryan 
at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view. So I put a match from every pay-per-view thus far because those were all these standout matches and were all worthy of the award, as well as that one Raw match between Cena and Cesaro. That was fantastic, too. And we're only – it's only June. We still have a half a year left, so there's still plenty of time for other matches, and I'm sure there will be. Like last year, we got our two best matches of the year at SummerSlam in the same night in Punk and Lesnar and Brian and Cena. So we'll just have to wait and see. More matches will be added to the list over time. Which newest addition to the main roster do you think has made the biggest impact? So I'm just going off the four superstars that have debuted in the last two months since WrestleMania. I'm not going to go with Xavier Woods or Emma, not like they would be my answer anyway. But um, of the four superstars that have debuted, Adam Rose, Rusev, Paige, and uh, Bo Dallas. Bo Dallas, it's hard to say because he's only debuted. He's only been here for like two or three weeks. Adam Rose has been here for a month. Rusev and Paige have been here for about two months. So it's hard to really say uh, Bo Dallas. He hasn't really been here all that long, and all he's been doing is squash matches so far. Rusev has two, and maybe Rusev is my answer. I'll go back to this in a second. But with Rusev, Rusev has gotten a massive push on the main roster. He's defeated a lot of credible guys in Kofi Kingston, Big E, our truth and they're not really credible, but those guys are mid-card guys, so it's better than defeating, like, I don't know, friggin' Yoshitatsu or whoever, uh, whoever Bo Dallas has been beating as of late, I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, Rusev has been shoved down our throats, not really in a bad way, but he's been built up as a monster, he's had, he had a very fun match with Big E at, uh, Payback last Sunday, which was, I really like that matchup. Um, he's got more air time probably than any of those people combined, so Rusev might have to be my answer. Paige she won the Divas Championship upon her debut. She's the youngest Divas Champion in WWE history. She would have been my answer had she been booked better. She's still champion. I'm not complaining about that. But she just really, the division really hasn't changed all that much from when she won the championship. Which is a shame because coming off of TakeOver, you have this phenomenal matchup between Charlotte and Natalya at the event. And then you have this good matchup between Fox and Paige at Payback. But it only got like six or seven minutes. It didn't go very long. It didn't really have a, a story attached to it, unlike the Charlotte and Natalya match from TakeOver last week. So that's kind of the biggest difference between the women's division in NXT and the Divas division in the WWE main roster. But, um, yeah, with Paige, she's had a very good run as Divas champion, but there's really nothing standout performance-wise that has really come to mind, aside from her match with Emma, uh, NXT arrival. But that was even before she debuted. That was back in February. Now I'd have to go on my match of the year uh, candidates as well, by the way. I forgot to mention that. But, um, yeah, so I, I'd have, probably have to go with Rusev. I think he's made the biggest impact. Sure, he's not holding championship gold right now, and I don't think he should anytime soon. But he's gotten more airtime than anyone. He's gotten good heat with the whole association with Vladimir Putin and all that bullshit. Um, he's got Lana by his side. He's been the most talked about superstar out of all of those four guys, Bo Dallas, Adam Rose, Paige, and Rusev. So I'd probably have to go with Rusev there. Um, next question comes from Andre G. His question was, how would you fix the NXT Tag Team Division? The NXT Tag Team Division right now needs a lot of help. All we really have right now are three teams. The Ascension, Ty Dillinger, and Jason Jordan, who disappeared for a while and recently resurfaced on NXT. And then Kalisto and El Local, if they're even still teaming, I'm not really sure. But first of all, add more teams. That's, I think, probably the easiest thing you can do, whether it be a pair of two single stars, which I'm not really a huge fan of, but if, do it if you must, or bring up a new tag team, two guys that haven't been on the roster before, um, two guys that, I mean, haven't been on TV before in NXT, so you can do that. So definitely debut more teams. That's probably the most obvious answer. And then just book them more consistently. Don't put the Ascension in fucking squash matches every single week. We've been, saying the same, we've been seeing the same shit from these guys for the last two years. Now, I'm a big Ascension fan. I love the Ascension. I've loved them since day one. But we've been seeing the same shit with these guys for the last two fucking years. They've been champions for however fucking long, but they've gotten the Dean Ambrose treatment. Now, they've never defended the titles. They've gotten maybe like three or four title defenses in the last nine fucking months. So I love the Ascension, and I think they're a good act, but... They could be perceived as boring because they never really have any interesting opponents. So maybe you put the belts on Ty Dillinger and Jason Jordan. If I had to switch the belts, I would have put them on Kalisto and El Local. Ty Dillinger and Jason Jordan, I like them, but they're a real odd duo. Like their backstage segment last week was just kind of freaky. It wasn't really all that funny. 
Um, they do have some potential, but not as much as Kalisto and LL Kyle, in my opinion. They should have just given the titles to them. But, uh, yeah, take the titles off Ascension. I know maybe promoting the Ascension to the main roster would be a bad idea, and it would take away a tag team from NXT, but the Ascension has been on NXT for so fucking long. They've been so overexposed down there. You need to move them up already. Maybe do a little feud with the Usos. So take the titles off the Ascension. Debut more tag teams. Give the teams more time. And don't put the teams against the same teams every single fucking week with the Ascension and the local athletes. That got old after like a month. And now it's two years later. And it's like the worst thing in NXT at the moment. So those are some things I would do to improve the tag team division in NXT. His next question was, which five superstars or divas would you redo their debut? Um, I'm only going off the current superstars. There's probably a lot of past guys that I would include, but I only looked at the main roster right now because it's probably easier. And I'm sorry for being lazy, but I just went off the main roster and people that could redo their that could redo their debut. Adam Rose's. I love Adam Rose and I love his debut, but a lot of people saw it as disappointing. It was just really strange. So Adam Rose, Dolph Ziggler, remember back in 08 when he was doing that fucking My Name is Dolph Ziggler bullshit? He was shaking his hand backstage. That was really odd. Um, so I would redo his debut. At the time, no joke, I thought he was Ric Flair's son. Not even kidding you. So Dolph Ziggler, he had a good match against Batista in his in-ring debut for a while. Um, Xavier Woods, he faced, uh, what did they do? 3MB, him and R-Truth faced 3MB. That was kind of a joke. And uh, that kind of set the tone for the uh, the remainder of his time in the main roster because he hasn't done bullshit since. He hasn't done jack squat. So Xavier Woods. Cesaro, if you can recall when Cesaro first debuted two and a half years ago, um, and it was like a backstage segment with Oksana and Teddy Long. And and um, he was with Oksana at the time. And Oksana was like, uh, he made Teddy Long rub like lotion on his chest or some, something gay like that. It was really strange. But, uh, yeah, Cesaro, like, you wouldn't even think that he'd be treated that way, but that was really odd. And then he came out, when he made his in-ring debut, he had that stupid-ass music, that entrance music, Angerland or whatever it was. He didn't do anything for a few months before he finally won the U.S. Championship, and that's when he really took off. But, yeah, Cesaro and Curtis Axel, not as Michael McGillicuddy, but as Curtis Axel, because remember a year ago when he made his debut as the newest Paul Heyman guy, it was a big thing. I didn't really mind the fact that he was a Paul Heyman guy. It was just the fact from day one that he was treated. He was put in a match with Triple H on Raw in the main event of Raw. Triple H's first match on Raw in, I think, maybe over three years. And then Triple H ends up getting a concussion or something dumb like that. And that was pretty much it. That that storyline played out for another few weeks, but it never really led anywhere. Because Triple H got that concussion. It prevented him from being in action against Axel for the next two, three weeks. But after that ended... He went into the whole authority thing, and it was never really mentioned again, so that was odd. So the whole concussion thing with Triple H took away from the debut of Curtis Axel, and the last thing we saw in that episode of Raw was Triple H just lying on the ground. Sure, it created a better cliffhanger for the next week's show, but it completely overshadowed Curtis Axel, and he was never really the same since, and he's just kind of been a bust since he got rebranded, which is a shame, but that's the way it is. Paul S., his question is, until when do we wait for the likes of Wade Barrett, bad news Barrett, Cesaro, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and Dean Ambrose to become main eventers? Into in due time, young Padawan, in due time. Um, we can't all get them as main eventers all at the same time, but all of them are pretty freaking close. I would argue, for one thing, I think the Shield, I mean Seth Rollins is already kind of gone, are main eventers. They just headlined their first WWE pay-per-view at Payback. And they've been in a lot of top-notch storylines since their debut against John Cena, The Undertaker, Randy Orton, The Wyatt Family, Evolution, and so many others over the last year and a half. Um, Team Hell No. So they've been in main events of Raw and SmackDown countless times, and they just had on their first pay-per-view. So I would already argue they are main eventers. So I mean, they might not be contending for the world championship right now, but... I would argue that with Daniel Bryan currently out and CM Punk gone, that they are already kind of near the top of the card. So on their own, it's going to take a while. I mean, once the Shield officially breaks up, I mean, I know Seth Rollins kind of parted ways with them last week, but when they all go their separate ways and they all kind of branch off into their own stuff, and then they all come back around for maybe a world title match down the line, which would be sexy as hell, I think that's when we can officially call the main eventers. Um, Wade Barrett is getting close. He's, you know, just worry about him as IC champion right now and still some prestige in that belt before you move on to the world championship. But if he continues to get over as he is, 
and continues to have good matches. He's had good matches with RVD, with Sheamus in the last couple of months. And um, so if he continues to go on this right track that he's on, he'll be a main eventer, hopefully and finally before long. And um, with Cesaro, he's also getting close. He's a Paul Heyman guy. He's had great matches with John Cena, Sheamus, Randy Orton in the last number of months. So they've all been on rolls. So Cesaro, I think he could be a main eventer, if, if he, especially if he wins the Money in the Bank briefcase later this month. He could be an official main eventer by the end of the year, even if before that as world champion. So all of these guys are all doing great right now. I think they're all near the top of the card, and they officially will become main eventers probably before the end of the year, or before the end of the year or next year if they're if they continue the uh, the rate that they're on at the moment. They're all being pushed greatly, and I love it. At Cody Collier, now time for the Twitter questions. His question was, what do you think is the most underrated and overrated Money in the Bank ladder match in WWE history? I watched the Money in the Bank anthology DVD that was released, I think, last year and watched every Money in the Bank ladder match. But a lot of them were just, they really just blended together. And I watched it maybe like November. So it's really hard to say which one kind of stuck out uh, above all the others. And all of them are great. I mean, there's never really been a terrible Money in the Bank ladder matches. A, a terrible Money in the Bank ladder match. There's been some that have been worse than others, but none that have been really like offensive, uh, offensively bad. Um, even the one with John Cena and The Miz and Jericho and Kane a couple years ago in 2012, I wouldn't necessarily call it underrated, but a lot of people called it shit. I thought it was fun for what it was. They made the most of it. They had The Miz come in. They had him return that night and insert himself into the matchup. I thought that was cool. I didn't think that was a bad match. I thought that was entertaining for what it was. It wasn't your typical Money in the Bank ladder match, but it was fun for what it was. And the finish was kind of dumb, too, with Cena hitting the briefcase over Big Show's head and then it breaking off. That was kind of stupid and lame. But um, I thought the match itself was entertaining. I don't really call this underrated because it gets a lot of praise. But um, the one at WrestleMania 24 is probably my favorite. I thought that was a terrific Money in the Bank ladder matches, a terrific Money in the Bank ladder match, and probably one of the best ever in terms of Money in the Bank. Um, so I thought that was great. CM Punk won that one. Um, overrated. Um, I don't know. The first one was great. I wouldn't call that overrated. One that I really didn't like. I wouldn't call it terrible. It was just disappointing. And I don't know. It doesn't really get that much praise, so I can't really call it overrated. But if I had to pick one overrated one, it would be the one from WrestleMania 26. It was the last one in the WrestleMania history. And it sucks because it was kind of – it left a bad taste in – terms of um, left a bad taste in many people's mouths in terms of, be, of it being at WrestleMania before it transitioned into pay-per-view. It was the last time the match was ever at WrestleMania. But that match at WrestleMania 26 that had like 10 guys in it, and they just kept on taking turns. And usually that's what you do in a Money in the Bank ladder match. But it would be two people in the ring at the same time, then eight other fucking guys sitting outside the ring for like 10 minutes before they got their turn. It wasn't a terrible match, but it was really odd, and the finish was Swagger taking down the briefcase with Tim taking like 10 minutes to do it. That was really strange, so that match was kind of a disappointment in my opinion, so I guess I would have to go with that. The WrestleMania 23 one, I, I see that one get a lot of praise. I didn't think it was like over-the-top amazing. I thought it was good. I didn't think it was as great as some of the other ones, but maybe WrestleMania 23. But if I had to pick one underrated, um, maybe WrestleMania 24 or... I don't know, any of the other ones, I guess. The first one, overrated, 26. Um, Next question from Cody comes from, or it comes from Cody, but his question was, what did you like most about Matt Stryker when he was on commentary for pay-per-views? Just not so on pay-per-views, Raw, SmackDown, whatever. The guy had fucking passion. The guy had fucking passion for the product, which is what we need. And I remember being annoyed with Matt Stryker sometimes because he would act like he knows it all. But he was a perfect heel on commentary. He was no Bobby the Brain Heenan, but he was a great fucking commentator. Because he had passion for the product. He knew a lot of stuff. He's very knowledgeable. He knows what he's talking about. And he's very well spoken too. So I love to hear him on Matt. I, I love to hear Matt Stryker on commentary, especially at the Royal Rumble. I mean, the Royal Rumble 2011, the last, <laughs> I think that was the last show that he ever called. Um, the This is a mark out moment. I'm marking out, bro. That whole thing. I thought that was great. But, um, yeah, Matt Stryker, he had fucking passion. Michael Cole gets a lot of shit. I think a lot of it unwarranted. But he just doesn't have passion for it. You go back, and he does have a passion for the business. I'm not saying that. But it's just not JR material. No one's going to be the next Jim Ross. There will never be another Jim Ross. 
But I don't know. Just when you go back and watch the ending of the streak, he's like, the streak is over. And that's it. Like, there's no, like, oh, my God, the streak is fucking over. It's over. Oh, my God. He got it. has been broken in half. You know, nothing like that. Nothing ever like that nowadays. And it's a shame. Jerry Lawler, I think it goes without saying, has not been the same since he turned face a couple years ago. He's been, what is he, like 60-something now? I don't I, – I wish no ill will on him, but I would rather not hear him on commentary, to be honest with you, um, at this day and age. I mean, just go do something else. I mean, he's been doing commentary for so long, and um, he just needs to go away. Jerry Lawler, you need to find another role for him. On commentary, he does nothing. He has no passion. Half the time, he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> he has no idea what's going on half the time. And it's like an inside joke that he doesn't even watch SmackDown, so he has no idea what's going on over there. And no one watches SmackDown, but, I mean, if you're part of the company, you would think you would know what's going on with the storylines and whatever. But anyway, um, Jerry Lawler needs to go. And JBL, I mean, he just says, I like JBL. He's entertaining more often than not. But he just says a lot of the same shit. Air Usos, Air Goat, Air Brian, all that kind of stuff. Give it a break, man. Come up with some new material. I love GBL, but he's just – he can be annoying at times. I mean I know he's a heel commentator, but it's just like shut the fuck up and call the action, man. But it's not even like – Michael Cole – heel Michael Cole a couple years ago. I don't know. He didn't even call the action either. But good heel commentators call the fucking action and leave the bullshit at the door. You can still be a heel and call the action, hate the wrestlers in the ring and, you know, hate the matchup or whatever. Just don't, you know, go off in your little la-la land and your tirades on commentary that have nothing to do with the match at all. That's what the most annoying thing ever is on commentary nowadays for me. But going back to the, the, the topic at hand, Matt Stryker, it was a shame that he got released last year. I thought that sucked. Um, I thought he was a great hand to have for WWE, for interviewer, commentator, panel host, whatever. I thought it, Matt Stryker was great. But, um, yeah, what did I like most about him? Fucking passion, people. Fucking passion. That's something you can't teach. You just have. Jerry Law and Michael Cole and JBL just don't have that. At the average grunt, his question was, what do you think about Batista's bitchy responses to fan feedback? Should we ne should we rename him Boohoo Tista? Um, I think a lot of it is just trolling the fans as opposed to him being legitimately angry. And he's done a lot of good stuff with that since his return. This is just speculation. I'm not saying this as 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 fact. I'm not saying this is you know his way of doing it. I, this is just the way I perceive it of him just trolling the fans, like coming out at payback with all the blue um un the whole blue outfit, which I thought was hilarious. The blue Tista trend that got going on Twitter that same night. Um, but I thought that that was done obviously on purpose. You have fucking Orton and Triple H come out in black, and he comes out in all blue, looking like a blueberry. I mean, that was obviously done on purpose to to attract attention to him and to get people talking and get more heel heat and stuff like that. That was obviously done on purpose, and he knew he was going to get a backlash from the fans, and people were just having fun with him. So that's why he had that response on Twitter, like calling him Marks. So he didn't call him Marks. He called him, I don't know, little dipshits or something. And that's entertaining. Batista was a great heel, and he'll be back eventually, but I thought his run was a success in my opinion. But more thoughts on that in other videos I hear on the channel. But, um, yeah, I, I don't really think it's him being legitimately angry or anything like that, him being pissed off. It's just him being a great heel because he does things that that he knows they're going to get him booed. I don't know if that's why he wasn't supposed to be a heel when he came back, but that's maybe the, why he continued to wear these skinny jeans um, in subsequent weeks when he came back because he got booed from it. He got people talking, the, 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 the track jacket and stuff like that. It gets people talking, so that's why he wears it. Like the blue attire. I thought that was funny as fuck. And it attracted attention. So it, it did that and it trended on Twitter for the for that entire match uh, between the Shield and Evolution. So, no, I don't really think we need to call him Boohoo Tista. Um, blue Tista, Beard Tista, Bi Tista. There's so many hilarious hashtags out there. But, yeah, it's not because he's angry. I just think it's because he's just likes, he just likes trolling the fans. His next question was, could Rollins be pulling a punk in the new breed where he joins just to destroy them. Well, when you tweeted me that initially last week, it might have been even on Tuesday or Wednesday, like right after this happened, um, I thought it was a great idea. It was something innovative because no one no one else was really saying that at the time. Um, but I've heard a lot of people, you know, start speculation as to that's going to happen, people thinking it will happen. And this is a flaw in the storyline um, in terms of, like, how that would work out and stuff like that and why it wouldn't make sense. For one thing, if he was joining Evolution just to destroy them, why? 
because Batista quit. So if he stayed with the Shield, he would have already had the advantage. So it's not like with the Nexus. It's not like the Evolution was this big ass stable and they had so many unstoppable forces that you had to join them. You had to join them to destroy them to destroy them like John Cena did. It's not like that at all. They were only down to two people. So that you already had the advantage. He's already beaten Evolution like a million times at Extreme Rules and Payback. He was in the most dominant faction in WWE. So I don't. We will have to wait tonight and Ron. By the time you watch this, either on Tuesday, Wednesday, later on in the week, I don't know. Um, they'll probably have already explained it on Raw, or they might hold out and wait another couple of weeks. I don't know, but um, I'm interested to see on how this makes sense. And I don't think it's because he's a, a double agent. I would love to think so because I would love to see the Shield back together. I was pissed off that the Shield ended, not like booking wise, like oh that's a terrible idea, but I mean as a fan, it was very sad to see the Shield finally come to an end. So I would love to see it. I just don't see it happening because it would make no sense. Um, if only because Evolution was already down to two guys, so there's really no point in destroying it with it with, from within because it was already coming to an end anyway. And he was already in the most dominant faction ever, so there's really no purpose in going over to Evolution just to destroy them. So I don't see that as a possibility. It is possible. We've seen stupider things from WWE in the past. So I wouldn't rule out that possibility, but honestly, I just don't see it happening. Um, at JGF tweets, his question was, should the WWE Network produce a best of FCW special? Absolutely. Tweet me that question. I thought it was a great question because it's a great idea. Um, FCW, when it was still around, you never heard anything about it. Now the NXT, I mean, I know it's a show and whatever, but it, because it's a developmental system and WWE's been pushing it so aggressively these last couple of years since I rebranded it, it gets mentioned maybe like every week on Raw. Because so many people come up from NXT. But when people used to come up from FCW, uh, FCW, and they would never mention it at all. They'd be like, oh, here comes the newest FCW talent. And they would never say that at all. Or OVW or whatever. Um, I think that would be great if they did a best of FCW special. Because the only real FCW footage that I've seen is from YouTube. I don't know if it used to air. I don't know if it was a TV show in the area in Florida or whatever it was. Because I would have loved to watch it. And we had, like, the Shield. I know there was, like, a match between Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Dean Ambrose before they became the Shield. They were in, like, a triple threat match with each other on FCW TV. So I would love to see something like that. I mean, people are asking for all the old footage. And I want to see the old footage, too, on the WWE Network. But it'd be very cool if, you, if we could get some unseen FCW footage on the network. And even if not that, then the best of FCW special, as you suggested. So absolutely, I think it would be a terrific idea. Looking at looking at the stars before there were stars like Sheamus, Dolph Ziggler, Wade Barrett, Daniel Bryan, so many people on the main roster. I mean, maybe like half the current roster has been through WWE's develop developmental system at FCW and NXT. Um, over well over half the roster. So yeah, absolutely, I would love to see something like that. And the final question comes from at the A Innovator. His question was, do you think Bo Dallas, Bo Dallas's character, in a way, is kind of like Kurt Angle's early character in the WWE? Kurt Angle, I, obviously, I wasn't a fan at the time, but going back and watching footage of him back when he first debuted, just his WWF run in general, WWE run, he was so freaking funny, and you just don't see that nowadays during his time in TNA. Maybe that's a better thing because he comes off as more serious and whatever. But he was serious in WWE from time to time, but he was just involved in so much hilarious shit. And don't blame it on the Attitude Era, like, oh, because it's not the Attitude Era anymore, we don't see stuff like that anymore. That wasn't the case at all. A lot of the stuff that he did was good, genu genuinely funny stuff. That it doesn't have to be PG-14 to be funny. He wasn't going around, running around naked or anything like that. Like, the cowboy hat was funny. A lot of the stuff that he did with Mick Foley and Edge and Christian, and obviously Edge when they did their whole angle... It's funny stuff that would work and fly today in WWE's PG product. Bo Dallas, is he like the modern day Kurt Angle? Wrestling wise, no. I think that's an obvious no. I think that's an obvious no. And I think you already know that. I don't think that's a question that you asked. But in terms of being motivational, like the when Kurt Angle had his three eyes, intelligence, integrity, intelligent intelligence, integrity, and intensity. And then Bo Dallas is kind of motivational. It's not an exact replica, and they obviously didn't use Kurt Angle as the mold for the Bo Dallas character, but I could definitely see where you're coming from in terms of similarities, like in being in terms of being motivational and stuff like that. So there are there are some similarities. I just don't see it being an exact an exact replica. 
If only because Kurt Angle used to like go out of his way to get heat. Bo Dallas, it's a little confusing right now because he comes off as a babyface, but then he sometimes takes shots at the crowd. Um, so it's a little different. He's like a parody of John Cena in that he thinks he's a face, but he's really a heel. It's kind of hard to explain. Kurt Angle wasn't really that way. So it was. It, it's different in that sense. I don't think Kurt, Kurt Angle ever really thought he was a babyface. He was just genuinely fucking hilarious. So um, I wouldn't say it's a lot like Kurt Angle back in the day, but there definitely are similarities. I can definitely see where you're coming from. So that's going to do it for this week's question, guys. I really appreciate you guys for checking out the video. Always appreciate it. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All that good stuff. I forgot to show you this before, but I'm wearing my Christian shirt today. Hashtag one more match. Hopefully he's back uh, sooner rather than later in the ring and not as a panelist on an NXT TakeOver event, which I did enjoy, but you know, I don't think he's going to be back in the ring anyway. I think he might retire by the end of the year, but we'll have to wait and see. Just one of my questions, just to show the support for Captain Charisma. But nevertheless, folks, thanks again for watching. I'll be right back here next week with another hashtag AskJason video. This is Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys next week.